me Collins. Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. Your humble host is sneaking in a day off tomorrow. I'll be heading to the coast to meet up with some friends who've traveled up from Southern California. Back here on Thursday, hopefully a little refreshed. So uh, I've seen this pattern emerging through a a combination of suggestion to his cult followers and projection of democratic behavior that is unlikely, Trump is laying the the groundwork for his loyal followers to revolt in some form if he doesn't manage to prevail in the election in November. And I want to credit Greg Sargent. He's an opinion writer at the Washington Post who is sounding a bit of an alarm. And he suffered through an episode of Foxy Friends this morning where Trump again told his supporters that if the election doesn't deliver the result they want, the outcome is inherently illegitimate, that there are no democratically legitimate circumstances under which he and supporters could lose in a fair election. And he's been working on this for months, raising chaos and false doubts about mail-in voting and projecting onto the Democrats that they are seeking to rig this election in order to cause him to lose. And he says that the hype over the coronavirus is part of a Democratic plot to get rid of him. He's got acolytes and allies who pipe up and talk about how the deep state is doing everything it can to hurt the economy, to sicken and kill people through COVID. But the overarching mission is to defeat the narcissist-in-chief. And Sargent continues, By my count, this is the third time he's stated this explicitly in recent weeks. He will generally say both that the election is likely to be rigged and fraudulent and that he can only lose if that happens. Yet the political press usually responds by fact-checking only the first half of this by debunking his claims about fraud. And as we have seen, He has dog-whistled for his armed, extreme, white MAGA men to hit the streets. He said that the killing by federal marshals of the suspect in the Portland shooting that led to the death of a Patriot prayer member was proper and that it was a form of retribution. And so when he goes to his mob rallies, he's even more virulent in spreading these messages. And I believe he is setting the stage for some form of revolt by his followers who will fall in line and hit the streets, probably with their guns, should the election not come out in his favor. And then there are the issues where Trump keeps projecting that he needs the result by election night or the next day at the latest. And we know that's not going to happen. There are too many states that will be busy tabulating mail-in ballots for at least a week. In California, (laughs) the deadline for a mail-in ballot to be received is the end of the week of the election. In other states, they have to be received or postmarked on election day. So we know that there is not going to be a resolution of the election unless it's a landslide on election night. But he, of course, (laughs) wants to imagine that he is going to be swept into a second term 
and that it will be so overwhelming that the result will be available on or near election night. And given the tensions that he has stoked over race, Black Lives Matter, claiming that Biden is the candidate who represents the anarchists and the looters, that they're coming to destroy your suburbs. He's got a lot of people really feared up and scared shitless. And I feel fortunate that in the past 10 days, Twitter has not been sharing, uh, without my request, any of Trump's tweets. But this morning when I flipped on my phone, it's not actually a flip phone, but I pushed the button and it lit up. I had more than a dozen new followers on Twitter. And most of them in their little, you know, Twitter bios. Pledge allegiance to Trump. There's a MAGA guy in there. There's several QAnon people in there. And I don't know what I owe this honor to. (laughs) But... uh, These are pretty scary times. And Trump is hoping to pivot and profit and leverage the confusion, the division, and the unrest. As Democrats keep blaming that on Russia. (laughs) As I always say, Americans are really good at it and we don't need any outside help. So yesterday, toward the end of the podcast, I reported on this outburst in a Facebook live feed from Michael Caputo, who Trump installed over at Health and Human Services as a kind of a snitch. And Caputo has been uh, editing or demanding edits in reports coming from the CDC, including what they consider to be a very important weekly report on morbidity and mortality. And I read some of the bizarre comments from Caputo. He said, since joining the administration, my family and I have been continually threatened. We've been in and out of criminal court dealing with harassment prosecutions. He said that uh, his mental health has definitely failed. And then to prove it, he said, I don't like being alone in Washington, describing shadows on the ceiling in my apartment. There alone, shadows are so long. But in the same rant, despite his challenged and diminished mental health, he predicted that Trump would win the election, but that Biden would refuse to concede. And when Donald Trump refuses to stand down at the inauguration, the shooting will begin. And his paranoia is so vivid, he said, the drills that you've seen are nothing. If you carry guns, buy ammunition, ladies and gentlemen, because it's going to be hard to get. Now, this is the form of projection that Trump often uses to distract from his own defects and uh, illegal intentions. He projects them onto his enemies and opponents. And that's what Caputo is doing here. Now, Senator Patty Murray of Washington State, a Democrat, and Congresswoman Rosa DeLauro of Connecticut, also a Democrat, have called for Caputo's firing. It won't happen, but they're making the right call. And I didn't know that much about Caputo. It turns out he's a former radio talk show host. He is a friend of Roger Stone's. He's a Trump loyalist who, back in 2014, worked to help Trump in his unsuccessful bid to buy the Buffalo Bills. Caputo lives in Buffalo. And then he joined the campaign for Trump in 2016. So we're still trying to figure out whether the claims by Jeffrey Goldberg in The Atlantic, based on four anonymous sources, that when Trump went to France... In 2018, in events that honored the veterans who died in World War I, that he didn't go to the ceremony at Bellow Wood because it was raining and that might ruin his hairdo. 
Goldberg said that his sources told him that a peevish president that morning referred to the dead American veterans as suckers and losers. And this has been widely reported, and Trump has been widely rebuked for this disrespect to the buried dead soldiers. And so I've admitted that Jeffrey Goldberg is a sketchy guy. I don't give him full credibility. But my bias leans toward that, that this is something that Trump would have said. It is not outside the realm of possibility. And so Trump has doubled down, and the White House press office has produced a list of 25 people who are quoted in various forms of denial, many of which are not very specific to this incident. And so the fact-checkers at the Washington Post have examined these 25 individuals and the statements that they've made. And they rule out 11 of them from the get-go because they were not with Trump on the trip to France. That leaves 14. So they carefully scrutinize the statements, starting with John Bolton, who has said, I didn't hear either of those comments or anything even resembling them. And these fact-checkers at the Washington Post lean on a comment that Bolton made to the New York Times. I'm not saying that he didn't say those remarks later in the day or another time. But he has flatly said that in the decision-making meeting where Trump decided not to go, quote, I didn't hear either of those comments or anything even resembling them. Next in line... Deputy Chief of Staff former Zach Fuentes. I did not hear POTUS call anyone losers when I told him about the weather. Now, that's a pretty carefully constructed denial because it's linked to that one moment when he told Trump that it was raining and the helicopters couldn't fly. And Fuentes said the Atlantic sources are conflating people from something the day after. And again, the Post fact-checker kind of uses that as a support, saying it suggests Trump may have said something along these lines, just not at the day that Jeffrey Goldberg alleges. So this is an interesting exercise. I've linked to it in the show file for today's podcast. It goes through all of the 14 individuals, and many of them aren't credible in their denials. But what's interesting is typically at the end of one of these fact-checking articles, the Post assigns a number of Pinocchios. But the most they can say is, we could hand Pinocchios to Trump for inflating the numbers, but it's difficult to settle on a rating without determining how many of the 14 witnesses are truly credible. And so it comes down to the silent men the guy who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the time, who was present, and retired General John Kelly, who was the White House Chief of Staff at the time. And both uh, General Dunford and Kelly have remained silent up to this point. Will they go public and confirm what Goldberg has reported? Or is this truly fake news? One of the items that's recently been used to slam Trump is the claim that remains unproven that Russian money was paid to Taliban fighters for the heads of American soldiers in Afghanistan. And I want to credit Caitlin Johnstone for staying on the story and noting that even NBC News, which has used this as a cudgel on Trump, particularly on its cable channel, MSNBC, they have reported two months after top Pentagon officials vowed to get to the bottom of whether the Russian government bribed the Taliban to kill American member, service members, the commander of troops in the region says a detailed review of all available intelligence has not been able to corroborate the existence of such a program. 
We continue to look for that evidence, says General Frank McKenzie, commander of the U.S. Central Command. I just haven't seen it yet. But Rachel Maddow is unbowed. Just last week, I heard her interviewing Michael McFaul, the Obama administration's ambassador to Moscow, now in residence at Stanford University, and McFaul inserted a qualifier about the reported Russian bounties. Well, Rachel Maddow doesn't use any of those qualifiers. She reports it as fact. And quoting John Stone, it was never anything of the sort. It was fake. But now aggressions have been ramped up against Russia. Trump has been painted as a Putin puppet who hates the troops. Senate Democrats have introduced a bill mandating sanctions on any Russians involved in this imaginary conspiracy. And legislation has been passed, making it harder for Trump to withdraw troops from Afghanistan. And Peter Strzok, the former FBI official, who is uh, promoting his book, which is centered around arguing that Trump is captive to Russia. In an interview with The Atlantic, he cited Trump's refusal to strike back at Russia over the Taliban bounties as evidence that the president is compromised. Biden has falsely attacked Trump for not confronting Putin about the bounty story. Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut falsely claiming intelligence powerfully shows that the Kremlin offered the Taliban bounties for killing Americans in Afghanistan. You notice he uses the word offered. He doesn't say they were actually paid. So it's important. I think it's pretty clear that I don't support Trump. But I have a higher commitment to accurate reporting and against the weaponization of allegations that <laughs> come from anonymous sources in the intelligence community. Now, here's a story that I'm really curious about because I've seen it on Facebook, but it's attributed to Yahoo News and to other less than mainstream outlets. And the best reporting I found on this today is at The Guardian where based on testimony of Don Wooten, who was a nurse at a corporate prison where women are locked up under the control of Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And Don Wooten, who worked at uh, the Irwin County Detention Center under a contract to LaSalle Corrections, that's the private employer, she says that there has been a high rate of hysterectomies performed on women, some of whom did not consent to it and didn't really know uh, why they were being operated on and why their uteruses were being removed. So Wooten reported an alarmingly high rate of hysterectomies being performed on Spanish-speaking immigrants, many of whom did not appear to understand why they had undergone the procedure. She said an off-site doctor supposedly performed the surgeries on women who complained of heavy menstrual cycles, but the many women seemed to not understand what had happened. In many cases, nurses obtained consent from patients by simply Googling Spanish. Everybody he sees has a hysterectomy, Wooten said, just about everybody. That's his specialty. He's the uterus collector. Everybody's uterus cannot be that bad. Now, Wooten is battling charges, or, or she's battling uh, attempted forms of reprisal. She says she was demoted and reprimanded when she spoke out about these practices. But this article in The Guardian cites as the original source The Intercept. So, over at The Intercept today... Under the bylines of Jose Olivares and John Washington, you will find a lengthy story. It runs 22 pages based on the reporting, the whistleblowing of Don Wooten. But in the 20 or 22 pages here, there is no reference to her hysterectomy charges. And so 
I did a Google search. Ice, comma, hysterectomies. There are no mainstream outlets that have picked up on this, including the New York Times and the Washington Post. And I'm left to scratch my head. Because if The Intercept first broke an interview with complaints from Don Wooten, why did they, their editors or their lawyers, decide to leave out the part about hysterectomies? And why did The Guardian choose to report that when it wasn't in the primary source that they cited? And all I can say is that if this is proven, the doctor who has performed those surgeries is a modern-day Mengele, and whoever had knowledge of this or approved it, is culpable of a form of medical malpractice that is really depraved. And just for context, here in California, it was exposed that in the 1960s, there were forced sterilizations of female prisoners in the Department of Corrections. This does happen. But to see it apparently happen to undocumented people who are being held, presumably before deportation, is truly sickening. On the immigration front, the formerly liberal Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals here in San Francisco, Trump and uh, good old Mitch McConnell, have packed it with conservatives. And in a two-to-one decision yesterday, they lifted the ban an injunction that had been issued in 2018 by a district judge, Edward Chen, that prevented the administration from ending temporary protected status for immigrants from Haiti, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Sudan. This is about 300,000 people who live and work in the USA today. And if this goes full cycle, there are delays that are built in, uh, of up to six months or a year before they can actually face deportation. But this would be sending people back to those shithole countries that have so upset Trump. And we'll see. Uh, this is, it's been remanded back to the lower court for further proceedings, and it's likely this will be tied up in the courts for some time. But the intention is once again very clear and very ugly. Yesterday we reported on the efforts by lawyers for the Democratic Party to engage in voter suppression in Pennsylvania and in Wisconsin by blocking the Green Party from having its candidates, Howie Hawkins and his running mate, on the ballot this November. And I consider this to be very ugly and in an article that runs almost six pages in the New York Times today, they consider this a matter of uh, fairness. They're surprised that the Supreme Court of the state of Wisconsin did not, in a partisan manner, force the ballots to be reprinted to include the Green Party candidates. They don't reference democracy or fairness. They put it in the frame of the expansive sense of entitlement that Democrats have, that Green Party voters are a nuisance who cost Al Gore the election in 2000, who cost Hillary Clinton the election in 2016. They believe that the Green Party steals their voters. And this is so enraging to me. As you know, I'm not a member of the Democratic Party, and this is one of the reasons. And that's, it's rationalized by many rank-and-file members of the party as, hey, Trump is an existential threat. We've got to do whatever we can to get Biden over the line. Who cares if he's a weak candidate? He's what we've got, and now we've got to use everything, even underhanded tactics, to prevent the Green Party from ruining it. <laughs> and... and I just think that this is amazing. And they're claiming because the 
vice presidential candidate Angela Walker submitted petitions that had her wrong home address, as if that matters. And there was this. This is a really weak technicality. It's the equivalent of being pulled over and then locked up for years because your taillight is out. <laughs> They're claiming that the Green Party delayed its filing. And Howie Hawkins says, well, we are screwed. He said, we tried to get a lawyer to carry this case. The only people who would take it were Republicans, whose motives were not pure. And if there's any, uh, I don't want to call it a silver lining, but apparently the same problem is uh, being encountered by Kanye West, who so far is not on the ballot in Wisconsin, and I think that's unlikely to change. One of the calls for chaos that has originated from Trump is his constant attacks on the mail-in voting process and the underhanded effort with uh, Louis DeJoy, his donor and appointee as Postmaster General. And it's hard for us to know whether the mail service has actually been impacted by the changes that DeJoy has implemented. So the New York Times on Monday published a report based on letters that were tracked by a third-party group called Snail Works. And this uh, reflects an analysis of 28 million pieces of first-class letters. During the summer slowdown, first-class mail that's normally projected to take three days to deliver was on average less than a day late. Mail traveling shorter distances also slowed this summer with most delayed mail arriving one day late. Now, in my own experience, there are certain checks that I get on predictable dates. These are automated payments. And I found that most of those were delayed by three or four days in August and September. So the Los Angeles Times took a different approach. And in an article published today, I've linked to it in the show file, They say that they mailed 100 letters between August 21st and the 24th to multiple destinations within California and across the country, showing that postal performance is spotty and dismal. A letter from a five-year-old boy named William mailed at the post office in the L.A. community of Silmar August 22nd was sent first class with a promise to arrive in one to three business days, and it arrived in Austin, Texas, 11 days later. Another letter mailed from Malibu to a San Francisco suburb sat in an L.A. processing center for three days and wasn't delivered for an additional four days after that. A letter sent from the Alhambra post office to a residence in Washington, D.C., took four days to get to the processing center in the capital and three more days before it reached its final destination. And they report there's no single snag in the complex postal delivery system, but they discovered multiple uh, choke points, they said. Only about half of the 40 letters sent to Atlanta and Washington were marked as arriving on time. Ten arrived within four to five business days. Eight were never marked in the certified mail tracking system as delivered, although they did end up arriving at some point. Overall, 75% of the letters sent by the Times that should have arrived within two business days actually arrived on time. And there is a burgeoning form of mail fraud that authorities are just catching wind of. There are fraudsters who are trying to game the unemployment payments, particularly those for people like me. I am considered an independent contractor or self-employed. And ordinarily, people like me don't qualify for unemployment assistance. But because of COVID, they made a special program called the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. And I qualify, and I'll just tell you here briefly, that uh, I got checks. It's actually a debit card, and they just put credits on it. But I got payments uh, in May, and then they stopped for 98 days. 
And I kept filling out these online forms that they asked me to, to recertify, and nothing happened. And so the only recourse I had, because you can't get anybody on the phone, they don't respond online, but there's a little survey that pops up every time I recertify, and I just kept rating the service as poor, and I put comments in there, and maybe somebody actually read them. I still doubt that, but for whatever reason, uh, in the last two weeks, they have caught up with all of my payments from May, including the $600 federal boost. And it's that $600 that led fraudsters to try to game the system. And so there's a woman who owns a rental unit here in the Bay Area. More than 30 envelopes from the California Unemployment Office arrived at that address because the unit was vacant. And there are cases where these letters have stacked up at houses and people have broken into the houses in order to get the letters. And you can feel on the, you know, just by touching the envelope whether there's a debit card in there or not. So it's not clear to me how, once the debit card arrives, that they're able to fully impersonate the individual and transfer that money or cash it out in a way that's not traceable. But it's a huge scam. And in Colorado, they said that in a six-week stretch this summer, 77% of new claims were not legitimate. It's sad. I mean, people really need that money. And to see these con artists out there scooping it up, pretty frustrating. Well, today, an announcement of some justice for Breonna Taylor. The city of Louisville has agreed to pay $12 million to her family. It's not clear if they've admitted uh, any, any wrongdoing but it is a settlement of the wrongful death lawsuit brought by survivors. And as you know, about six months ago, there was the no-knock raid on her apartment. She was trying to go to sleep in her bedroom, and her boyfriend was watching TV in the living room. And when the door was broken down, the boyfriend, thinking it was her ex-boyfriend, a drug dealer, fired off a shot. An officer was wounded. And that led to the rest of the raiding cops to just fire indiscriminately, killing Brianna Taylor. So in addition to the cash settlement, the police department has agreed to impose more scrutiny on officers during the execution of search warrants, make mandatory safeguards that were common practice in the department but not followed on the night of the raid. That doesn't sound like much reform to me. Meanwhile, in upstate New York, the mayor of Rochester, with the groovy name Lovely Warren, has really shown her tough side. The police chief, Leron Singletary, had already announced that he was retiring in the wake of the problematic death of Daniel Prude back in March. But Mayor Lovely fired his ass. And she said that a preliminary investigation into the death of Daniel Prude has shown what so many have suspected, that we have a pervasive problem in the Rochester Police Department. She suspended the city's spokesman and attorney for 30 days. She said there was a cover-up. Mr. Prude's death was not taken as seriously as it should have been. And the police chief, in 50 meetings between the day of his death and August 4th, never mentioned the Prude case. Other officials represented to the mayor that he died of a drug overdose. And his family member who called the cops that night, asking not for him to be killed, but for some intervention because he was sitting outside in cold weather, naked. And the brother said he thought he was doing crystal meth. Or PCP, I'm not sure which. It is amazing how the police handled this incident. They pinned him to the ground, and when he stopped breathing, that's when they called an ambulance, and he died about a week later. The autopsy said it was due to asphyxiation. 
Well, that's a cover-up that's been exposed. Here's a cover-up in progress. The Department of Homeland Security has notified the House Intelligence Committee that it's not going to cooperate and send any official witnesses as part of the investigation of the department's response to protests in Portland, Oregon. But what this is really about is the whistleblower Brian Murphy, who was demoted at DHS, and he's not a perfect guy, right? But he has become a whistleblower, and he's blowing the whistle about some important stuff. He said that he was told to revise his intelligence reports to play down or eliminate any hint of Russian election interference and the national security threats of white supremacists. And it's that white supremacist part that the New York Times reports, but Rachel Maddow can't uh, manage to utter because she's so obsessed with Russia, Russia, oh, and Russia. So Murphy will be testifying, but his colleagues have been instructed not to. And those instructions are obstruction. There are no two ways about it. Every day I like to pause for a second and thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. People like Chuck, Chuck Zlatkin, DGL, Arlene Baker, and Julie Dupree. They chip in 5 10 or 20 bucks a month, and you can do the same. All you have to do is visit peterbcollins.com forward slash sign up. Well, I don't want to do any victory dance here, but firefighters in California, there are almost 15,000 of them out on the lines right now, are getting a grip on the massive outbreak of wildfires across the state. We've also seen some more moderate weather, a wind shift without uh, big gusts, at least not here in the Bay Area so far. So the air quality has improved. This is the first morning that there was not a layer of ash on the windshield of my car. And while there is still smoke hanging in the air, and particularly visible in the valleys, things are improving. Also, Seattle got a little bit of rain. It's famous for all that rain, right? But... Uh, It didn't do much to clear the smoke-filled air in the Puget Sound region, according to the Seattle Times. And a National Weather Service forecaster said the smoke is going to continue. That's probably not going to be relief. There's probably not going to be relief for at least a couple of days. But it has moderated conditions. And not to say that the fires have just put themselves out, but... It has improved the situation for firefighters to get in and uh, hose them down. And there is some improvement in Oregon. There are a couple of fires that are described as 100% contained, but many continue to rage. There's still tens of thousands of people who've evacuated from their homes. In an anomaly, they actually reduced the estimated death count by two because remains that had been thought to be human turned out to be animals. So the, new, the Oregon death toll stands at eight, officially. And there's still about 50 people considered missing. That number goes up and down as uh, conditions change and evacuees move around and sometimes are able to uh, re- reinstate contact with their loved ones. More than a million acres have burned in Oregon, And the air quality in Portland remains quite poor. And I'm disappointed to report this to you. There have been four state prisons evacuated in the state of Oregon because of these fires. And many of them have all been jammed into the Oregon State Pen in Salem. And the conditions there are very dangerous. They don't have air conditioning. Most prisons do not. So they open up the windows and this foul, smoky, toxic air drifts in to prisoners who are packed into confined spaces. They're sleeping on floors. There are long waits for food. Conditions are unsanitary. And they have mixed gang members who had been separated in the four prisons and they're now all locked up in the same place. So when a couple of skirmishes broke out, 
the guards pepper sprayed pretty indiscriminately. And this uh, created even further problems for people with respiratory challenges. It's uh, fundamentally humane, and while I generally have a decent impression of Kate Brown, the governor of Oregon, she should be addressing this. And it should involve the release of more prisoners. Just for a lighthearted moment, as you know, Antifa has been blamed by right-wingers for causing the fires, for widespread looting in fire zones. And so some wag posted this on Facebook. Super secret Antifa planning committee study, confidential. Operation Infinite Milkshake. Then in bold uh, type it reads, Secret Antifa LLC planned to destroy the Republican Party. And it identifies two steps. Step one, do nothing as the GOP implodes from within. Step two, milkshakes. <laughs> well, the proceedings going on in London, the hearing related to the extradition to the United States of Julian Assange, resumed today, and it turns out that one of the key defense witnesses whose name is Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, that's Eric Lewis, he was testifying from some location in Italy remotely. And he apologized to the court because it was his computer that had, you know, a browser tab open. And I don't know about you, but I have about 20 of them open on my desktop at any time. And sometimes you hit the space bar and audio starts playing from a tab that you didn't know was active. And that's what happened to him when a <laughs> recording of a TV report about Julian Assange started playing on his system. Now, I don't know why they weren't able to isolate that and figure it out, but it shows that the British courts, like American courts, are not very tech-savvy. So this gets a little confusing because the prosecutor who represents the United States, a British lawyer named James Lewis, was cross-examining Eric Lewis. So we'll refer to James Lewis as the prosecutor and Eric Lewis as the witness. But uh, one of the key questions before the court is whether this is a political prosecution. And so one of the subjects that was batted back and forth was whether journalists can be prosecuted under the Espionage Act. And Eric Lewis, who is a longtime and distinguished attorney from the United States who has represented prisoners at Guantanamo Bay and elsewhere, well, he said that uh, there's never been a case of a publisher who's been successfully prosecuted in the United States. And he went on to say that Attorney General Barr, by ratcheting up the charges, there was originally one, now there are 18, 17 of those are under the Espionage Act. And this made a big difference. And so whether the prosecution is political is critical because the U.S.-Britain extradition treaty forbids extradition in a political case. So Shadowproof's Kevin Gostola has a good report on this today. So does Consortium News. And it details some of the issues that I just outlined. In addition, there's a lot of discussion about how Julian Assange would be incarcerated if and when he's extradited to the U.S. This also plays into whether it meets the terms of the extradition treaty. And because it's expected that he will be held in isolation, in solitary confinement, that is considered uh, an issue under the treaty. And if he were convicted, he would most likely be sent to a supermax prison like the one in Colorado, where he would indeed be isolated under the, uh, it's called a SAMS program. SAMS stands for Special Administrative Measures, and this is the most extreme form of isolation under the policies of the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. 
And the expert witness, Eric Lewis, he asserted that uh, while the U.S. claims that SAMS is not the same as being, you know, in the hole, subjected to uh, no contact with other people, that's exactly what it is. And Lewis said this is not a terrorist case because the other Lewis kept trying to make that assertion that essentially Assange is like a terrorist and therefore must be held under these most extreme uh, measures. So the most detailed report, and I highly recommend it to you, comes from Craig Murray's blog. And he even captured what is not quite verbatim, but the ping pong, the back and forth between the Lewises, James and Eric. And James Eric, uh, James Lewis is a, an arrogant prick who tries in many ways to humiliate or undermine by claiming that Eric Lewis is not a professional witness and uh, that his testimony should be disavowed. And he tries to make the claim that under Sam, that it's not solitary confinement. And Eric Lewis does a good job of responding to the peppering and just says, look, you, you're just arguing over semantics. And at one point, Eric Lewis says, stop being so fucking rude. <laughs> well, I don't think he said the F-bomb. Anyway, uh, the detail from Craig Murray is worth the read, so please check it out if you have the opportunity. I've linked to it in the show file for today's podcast here at PeterBCollins.com. I have a couple of items in the COVID-19 file today, one related to the exposure of nurses to COVID at hospitals where they didn't segregate the COVID patients. And this story from The Guardian is based on episodes in Oakland, across the bay from me, at the Alta Bates Medical Center. And a veteran nurse named Janine Paste Ponder worked there. She didn't have proper PPE. And she died in the middle of July from being exposed to coronavirus. And a survey of the union that I've done some work for, National Nurses United, of more than 21,000 nurses found that 32% work in facilities that don't have dedicated COVID units. So that uh, makes for potential exposure on a broad basis for the medical personnel who are treating the COVID patients. Speaker Pelosi said today that the House will not leave for the November elections without acting on an additional round of stimulus to prop up the economy, responding to growing concern among rank-and-file lawmakers over the prospect of going home empty-handed. We have to stay here until we have a bill, says Pelosi. Now, this is a risky proposition because the Democrats already have a bill and the Republicans have refused to touch it all summer long. But... A group of 50 centrist lawmakers, including some Republicans, who call themselves the Solutions Caucus, I think, the House Problem Solvers Caucus, excuse me, they have presented uh, what is kind of middle ground. Uh, it, it's $1.5 trillion, and the original price tag on the so-called HEROES Act is a little over $3 trillion. And this would include a restoration of the Paycheck Protection Program, direct checks of $1,200, and a uh, kind of scaled-down unemployment system that, uh, you know, is more than what the Republicans were offering, 450 for the first eight weeks, then 600 for the uh, next five weeks. And the proposal would send $500 billion to state and local governments, which is about half of what the Democrats had proposed. But Pelosi is trying to... <laughs> trying to keep uh, her caucus together and trying to negotiate for the full package because she knows Mitch McConnell is totally opposed to bailout money for state and local government, which is badly needed and, if it's not forthcoming, will push a lot of states into deep budget cuts and huge staffing cuts that will only deepen the recession or, dare I say, depression that we are facing. In Washington today, we saw further evidence of a foreign government meddling in the 2020 election. 
because Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu showed up for a signing ceremony of documents that uh, have more PR value than real impact. And these are agreements in which Israel establishes formal ties with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. Now, Trump is calling this part of a Middle East peace plan, but even the uh, commentators at the New York Times admit that especially when it comes to the UAE, that Israel and the UAE have had a quiet bond for several years now, uh, really related to their uh, common antipathy toward Iran. And Bahrain has been brought in here at the last minute to try to put some uh, window dressing or some whipped cream on the efforts of Crown Prince Jared uh, Kushner to negotiate a peace deal. And all this is based on isolating the Palestinians and cramming down some sort of a settlement by pulling their allies closer to Israel. And I think this is just a whole lot of fiction that is created to make it look like Trump is a peacemaker and also to allow Benjamin Netanyahu to pay back the support that Trump has shown him in domestic Israeli politics through the protracted uh, political process that has left him barely clinging to power as he faces corruption charges. And here is a quote from Mark Landler. I think this is Saturday's New York Times. This latest Arab-Israeli entente is neither a bolt from the blue nor the result of months of delicate shuttle diplomacy. Israel and the Arab leaders in the Persian Gulf have been quietly cultivating ties for years. United by their common antipathy toward Iran and worries about a vacuum in the region caused by American retrenchment. And they go to Marty Indyk, who is a pro-Zionist former ambassador to Israel under Bill Clinton. The import of this is as much is much more strategic than peace related. So it's not a real meaningful set of agreements, but it looks good as the election approaches. Also, this is rare. The sentencing phase of the trial of Amiram ben Yuliel, a Jewish settler, who was found guilty in May of murder for an incident back in 2015 where he committed arson. He burned down the home of Palestinian, uh, a Palestinian family. And right away, the 18-month-old baby died, and then the parents died uh, a short time later. And this is remarkable. He was already convicted, which is uh, uh, an advance of justice in Israel, but the court sentenced him to three life sentences for taking the lives of those Palestinians which are generally not valued very much by the Israeli justice system, in my humble opinion. I want to thank a listener named Sam who has emailed me a couple of times saying, Hey, Peter, are you following what's happening to Steve Donziger? And I have covered this uh, in the past, but it's been a few years. Donziger is the lawyer who won a $9 billion settlement from Chevron over Chevron's liabilities from its acquisition of Texaco and Texaco's long-term pollution of the uh, rainforest in Ecuador. And after Chevron decided to go on the offensive, they went into American courts and claimed that uh, Steve Donziger had engineered a, an illegal settlement, a tainted one. And so the case went before a judge in New York, Louis A. Kaplan. And I want to commend fairness, fairness and Accuracy in Reporting. I've linked to their article about this in the show file for today's podcast. But fundamentally, they are slamming Reuters, the International Wire Service, for its failure to really cover the true aspects of this case. And they go into some detail about the errors that they have published, the biased reporting that favors not only the judge but Chevron. They play down the legal brutalization of Steve Donziger. And they note the omissions in Reuters' coverage. They analyzed 32 articles since November of 2013. None of them explained why there was no jury in the trial. None explained how Chevron was able to go wild with discovery on Donziger while shielding itself from it. 
Never had to defend Texaco's environmental record in Ecuador. None mentioned that a Chevron PR consultant declared internally in 2000 that the corporate strategy is to demonize Donziger. And Donziger has been under a form of house arrest for contempt of the court for refusing to cough up his cell phone. And he's been locked up for a year now. And he is uh, suing or, you know, appealing the order to cough up his phone. And this home confinement will not be credited toward jail time that he will presumably face for the contempt charges. And finally today, there is some sort of a deal. I've described this as piracy. As Donald Trump decreed that TikTok has to sell its American operations to an American company. Microsoft was interested. Can't remember, somebody else was interested too. But Larry Ellison, who's one of the few boosters and donors to Trump in Silicon Valley, he controls Oracle, which has no background in a social media or video service like this. And there is an announcement of a deal with Oracle. But Oracle's not actually buying TikTok. They're creating some sort of a strategic partnership. Recently, China changed its laws to require a deal like this to get approval from the Chinese government. Also has to be approved by the U.S. uh, Treasury Department. So if you like TikTok, you should use it (laughs) with uh, gusto because nobody really knows Uh, what the future holds for TikTok here on these shores. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it far and wide, even with Steve Donziger. I remain Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you my